Now, I've seen a lot of this country. I go out of my way to see bad things because that's what you YouTube people want. And a lot of the rundown cities I've seen are places most people don't want to go into. You can call them ghettos if you want, although that word might be a little strong. But every place I'm going to show you has large parts of town that are poor, dangerous, and run down. Many have been all but abandoned. I think it's important for us to see what's happening in our communities. If we don't know about these tragedies, how do we fix them? And for a lot of us, looking at this puts our own lives in a perspective. As we drive through these areas, you'll notice many of the streets are empty. Sometimes, the scariest movies are when you don't see the monster at all. I was on a road trip in Florida one May and spent a lot of my time looking at the beaches and the new sprawl. I spent a couple days in Palm Beach, you know, the richest place in the country, home to Mar-a-Lago and seaside mansions. Well, the server at dinner asked if I had ever been to Pahokee and Belle Glade before. I was like, no. So I went there and wow, is it bad. Pahokee and Belle Glade are small communities in western Palm Beach County, along Lake Okeechobee. They call the whole area the muck because it was all swampland until it was drained to put in crops. It's a long forgotten about former agriculture hub way out in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of the people who live here are minorities in extreme poverty. A lot of what's left here are remnants of cheap housing thrown up for all the temporary field workers. What's left have become hovels that look like the god-awful slums of third world capitals. I saw lots of run-down apartments, trash, and a lot of people standing around looking lost. A lot of this region feels sad and deserted. This is like... This area has a history of extreme violence. At one point, half the men who lived here had felonies. There's a history of disease, overcrowding, poor sanitation, malnutrition. This area once had the highest HIV infection rate in the country too. CBS once called this area the harvest of shame. It has some of the worst conditions I've ever seen. There just aren't a lot of jobs here. A lot of what kept this place going was farming, but technology has put a lot of people out of work. A lot of these migrant field workers can only survive on government assistance now. Poverty so bad, they've talked about dissolving these communities entirely and just turn them over to the county. Let them handle it. It would be hard to have hope when you don't have money or an education or a trade. Say what you want about the true definition of a ghetto. There's parts of Chicago that are some of the worst places you can live. I was in Chicago for a day in the summer of 2021. I spent a lot of my time downtown, but I knew if I wanted to capture the essence of Chicago, I needed to get out into the inner cities. The south side of Chicago is known worldwide. It's full of murderers, gangbangers, shootings, poverty, everything that makes the place miserable. They don't measure monthly shootings on the south side. They measure weekend shootings. There were at least 800 murders in Chicago the year I was here. There's a good chance somebody died in this hood I'm driving in this very day. They shoot at the cops. They shoot at each other. They just shoot to shoot. It's lawless in some parts of Chicago. There just aren't enough cops on the streets. There's budget shortfalls, early retirements. 
People just do whatever they want here, and they know they probably won't pay the price. A lot of Chicago neighborhoods like this are seeing huge population declines. Inglewood might be the most famous South Chicago hood. It had 100,000 people in 1960. And today, there's less than 30,000. Driving around here, you'll hear a siren every 10 minutes. Of course, I'd be risking my life if I were to try to drive through this area during the night. But during the day, it's actually pretty dead. South Chicago being this way isn't surprising. What do you think is going to happen when half a city is undereducated and doesn't understand economics or politics and doesn't even care to? This is a drug and alcohol, mental illness, broken family, politicians don't give a shit, no God, no pride, no care in the world thing. And that makes me sad for our country. A lot of people here grow up with generational poverty and crime. What other life could they know? This is their normal. This is what Keokuk, Iowa used to look like. And this is what it looks like today. I spent a month traveling throughout the Midwest in the summer of 2022. I documented a lot of the smallish communities that dot the landscape in Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota. A lot of the trip was not looking at devastation. That was until I got to Keokuk. Keokuk's a river town on the far eastern side of the state, right along the Mississippi. Now, if you know anything about river towns, you'd understand that these were once vitally important for our country's economy. River towns like Keokuk served as our backbone for shipping and commerce. There were dozens of banks and hotels and lots of very wealthy people here a hundred years ago. But that was a long time ago. Industry changes, companies shut down, and people leave. Those who remain have limited options for a middle-class lifestyle. As I drove through Keokuk, I was actually pretty surprised to see just how bad things have gotten here. I've been to Rust Belt towns in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, but I hadn't really heard too much about Iowa's struggles. But it is bad here. Maybe the worst I saw in Iowa. Up and down Main Street are boarded up buildings. Businesses that couldn't remain open because they couldn't cut it financially. A lot of the surrounding neighborhoods are filled with homes in disrepair. Broken windows, peeling paint, rotting sideboards. Keokuk's a fading brick, broken sidewalk, what used to be sort of place. Some of this is caused by capitalism greed. You know, moving jobs overseas for bigger profits. And some of this was caused by an entire community unwilling or unable to pick themselves up and evolve. I guess there's an opening here for somebody to come in and snag up a bunch of cheap real estate. I suppose those with the widest eyes and a big imagination might see an opportunity. But a lot of people here today feel forgotten about. And here we are spending billions to help other countries when our own backyard looks like this. Damn. Sure, it's affordable here, but that comes at a price. Residents have a 1 in 100 chance of being the victim of violent crime, and 25% of this community collects welfare. A lot of these people aren't defined by poverty, though. For some people, if they have their basic needs, God, food, that's all they need. So maybe from the outside, it seems worse than it really is. But is this our future? It's not just Keokuk. All up and down the Mississippi are cities that have seen devastation like this. Like Cairo, Illinois. Three hundred miles south of Keokuk, also along the Mississippi, is the small obliterated community of Cairo, Illinois. There's about sixteen hundred people here these days, down from a peak of fifteen thousand a hundred years ago. 
I had heard a lot about Cairo and how it had been gutted by a loss of jobs. I was on a road trip on my way to Memphis one day in November, and I was finally able to make a detour to see the place. And it is bad. You could call Cairo an industrial relic, a live look at a ghost town in progress. It's the same thing we saw in Keokuk, a loss of blue collar jobs and extreme poverty. Six in 10 people here live on welfare. Back in the day, families could get by with a dad working for a factory and mom raising the kids. Not anymore, unless you want to live on the edge of poverty and despair. And crime here is four times higher than the rest of the country, too. This place used to be the center of commerce. In the 1920s, there were rich merchants and bankers and thriving businessmen wandering these streets. This is what it used to look like. And after a bunch of floods and riots and all the companies left, crime went up. At one point, 15% of Cairo's population was locked in jail. What? So a lot of people left when it started to go downhill. And a lot of the people who are still here are retired or can't afford to move away. Some of them are addicts who remain addicts because it's so cheap to live here. There hasn't been a private residence built here in 50 years. They tore up the housing projects because there wasn't a budget to keep them open. You can get a house here for as little as $700 these days. Can you believe that? There's a saying, from dirt we came to the dirt you'll go. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Maybe that's what we're seeing here. But we're in a country where the military says, no man left behind. And here we have an entire community left behind. Can these places be fixed? What would it take? And are they even worth saving? I guess it's all about perspective. You can look at a community and your impression is based on your personal situation and experiences. Rich people will be like, God, how do they do it? Poor people are like, yeah, that's my life. People in developing countries are like, hey, that actually looks kind of nice. But few of us know what it's really like to live on a Native American reservation. Now, there are many, many, many devastated Native American reservations in the USA. A long time ago, Americans moved into Native American lands, and there were big conflicts. After the fighting ended, the government set aside large areas in some of the most unsuitable land. Our Native American population has been living in these reservations ever since. There's poverty, and then there's next-level poverty. South Dakota has two of the poorest reservations in the country. One of them's here. It's called Rosebud. It's 1,970 square miles, way out in the middle of nowhere. Since I was already in South Dakota for another project, I just had to stop by and see Rosebud. I picked the biggest city here, which only has 1,400 people. Oh, you, can, you can keep going? Okay. Just about everything I saw in Rosebud was run down trailers and burned out homes. A lot of the homes here are now abandoned because the people who lived in them were cooking meth. They either burn down or become unlivable, so that puts a lot of people here on the streets. They already have a problem with housing as it is here, so every time a meth user destroys a house, that's one less house on this reservation. So, where does everybody go? Into these trailers. On the other side of town are all these old, falling down trailer parks. These used to be a somewhat decent place to live, but now this is all a true ghetto. All the displaced families who have nowhere else to go squish into these little boxes and try to make the best they can. Many don't have plumbing or reliable electricity. Hardly anybody has internet. I hear 40% of the people on this reservation are homeless. A 
friend of mine worked for the tribal council here, and she said corruption is rampant. Imagine that. Hardly any of the government money that the tribal leaders get actually makes it into the pockets of the people who live here. Human trafficking, drug addiction, gangs, cartels, thieves, poverty. The Native Americans make up about 2% of our population, and they are by far the poorest. Only 3% of this population is going to make it to the age of 65. What the damn hell, everyone? These people need more than money. They need counseling, job assistance, education, and they need to learn how to live a normal life. A lot of them are just stuck in their old traditions and don't have a clue as to how to join the modern world. Now, I've seen a lot of ruined downtowns in my day, but I don't know if I've ever seen anything like the abandonment I saw in St. Joseph, Missouri in 2022. Before I show you what it looks like today, I want to show you what it looked like in its heyday. This was a very vibrant community in the 1800s. It's located along the Missouri River, and St. Joe became the last jumping off point for travelers headed to the Wild West. This is where the Pony Express began. You may have heard of that. Then over time, the railroads and stockyards and steel makers left. The brick makers left. Everyone left. Machines and foreign labor took over. There really was no reason to be here anymore. America makes, and then the world takes. Today, St. Joe looks like it saw a major battle. They say 75% of St. Joe's downtown architecture is gone now. All cast aside for shiny and new. Say what you want about how it looks now. These buildings were built really well. A lot of these buildings have some beautiful architecture. Some people find this fascinating because they're a glimpse of old America, like old memories faded over time. Others like the haunting beauty of things that are perfectly flawed. The Germans even have a word for it, ruin lust. Some will say, this is the future of America. Buckle up, everyone. God, I hope not, but they might be right. Not all of St. Joseph looks like this, but I saw some really run-down neighborhoods. A lot of these hoods are some of the most dangerous you'll find in Missouri. But it's amazing how much a little yard work, a coat of paint, and picking up the garbage would help around here. When you live in an area like this, what's most important are the people around you. If you have family and friends in town, I guess a lot of the ugly would disappear. Maybe the surface doesn't matter. And to be honest, I think a lot of these people would feel uncomfortable in large manicured burbs where folks have big ideas and goals. A study came out that called St. Joseph the second saddest city in the country. But how do you define sad? Are abandoned buildings crime and poverty sad? Is it sad if you have something and then it's gone? Well, if so, then yes, this place would be sad. A lot of people who grow up poor feel they were once destined for great things. They thought the world loved them. But most of us realize the world loves itself.
a lot of people write to me and they say, you're driving around all these other bad places. Where are you from? What's your hometown look like? <laughs> well, to be honest, my hometown looks like shit too. I grew up in San Bernardino, California. I left California in 2010, but I still have family in the area. When I go home, my journalistic curiosity kicks in and I always drive around to see how bad things have gotten. But it wasn't until the last time I went that I did a story on it. Today, San Bernardino looks nothing like it used to be. It was about 30 years ago when poverty, drugs, and crime began moving into our area from Los Angeles. Then we lost our Air Force base and a bunch of blue collar industries. Corruption, bankruptcy, drugs, crime, poverty, and then homelessness crept in. Then a lot of the to-do people fled and in their place came low-income earners. It kind of just got worse and worse here every year. Driving around today, you see shuttered businesses and lots of trash. Druggies wander around aimlessly. Thieves steal copper from the abandoned mall. You see mentally ill people on every block downtown along with burned out office buildings. There's shit in the streets. There's piss on the sidewalks. You see homeless people getting medical attention. Homeless people drinking in the middle of the day. There's homeless people everywhere. They call them non-domiciled in California now, or my favorite, dwelling unaffiliated. You turn a corner here and you never know what you're going to see. This is where I used to go roller skating when I was a kid. This place was called Stardust Roller Rink. Today it's just dust. A lot of the neighborhoods are straight up run down. A lot of the people here are very poor. There's shootings here all the time and hardly anyone's caught. The thieves rampage the store so often that everything's behind glass now. The only way to fix this is to help the poor get housing and jobs. I don't know if they actually would be able to pull that off, but it's kind of a slap in the face that we give illegal immigrants more help than actual U.S. citizens. Here's what it used to look like here. Just an upper middle class city about an hour from L.A. where the blue collar folks could make a nice living. It was safe and thriving and just a pleasant place to be. Now, all these places we've seen are struggling, but they're still special to the people who grew up there. This is my old hometown, where I learned how to ride a bike, went to my first dance, and made my first friends. But there is nothing here now that hasn't been touched by neglect. Everything has signs of abandonment, and nobody seems to care. It's like they want it to be like this. They built this prison themselves. When I drive around my old hometown, Seems to me these people are both the prisoners and the guards. Our country is filled with drug overdoses, mentally ill, unhealthy, and tons of people who are one paycheck away from being homeless. We fight wars and we spend a lot of our money on other countries, but here we have a crumbling infrastructure everywhere and no plans to fix it. Memphis, Tennessee is one of the most tragic examples of America's downfall. You've heard about how bad this place is for crime and poverty. I had never been there before to see it myself, so I went there just before Thanksgiving in 2021. Ask anyone you know who knows Memphis well, and they'll tell you the south side of Memphis is where the worst of it is. So that's where I went, at 7 a.m., before all the troublemakers were up. As I began the drive, I saw two cops parked in a lot just on the fringes of the hood. They kind of looked at me with blank expressions. I think they thought I was lost and probably wondered, why is that guy heading into one of the worst hoods in the country? I found the south side of Memphis to be one of the worst parts of any town I had ever seen before. I saw kids walking to the bus among burned out homes and trash piles five feet high. I saw sheriff deputies knocking on doors while people were leaving the house for work. But overall, it was just eerily quiet. 
No cars, birds, no barking dogs. Memphis was the most dangerous city in the country at the time of my visit, and that would make this the most dangerous neighborhood in the U.S. There are two violent crimes an hour here on average, and by the end of the year, Memphis saw 327 murders. That's almost one every day. The cops don't want to work here anymore. They even tried $15,000 signing bonuses to get more law enforcement on the streets. That didn't work. Almost one in three residents lives in poverty in Memphis, but I'm going to guess 90% of this hood does. The poor kids, many of their parents are locked up. I don't know what some of these people are going to do. So many low paying jobs are being automated now. There's going to be millions of people phased out of the workforce soon. Fast food workers, retail, then what? Memphis was on the upswing for a while. At one point, it was growing faster than Nashville. It's home to the blues and Elvis and all that stuff. But things started to get dangerous and the white families left, taking a lot of jobs and tax money with them. Today, other than criminals and low lives, it's mostly just working class people just trying to get by. It's hard to live a life when you're living to work and survive. A lot of these are good people who've kept their sense of dignity in the face of despair. Good for them. Every one of these houses was somebody's dream at one point. Somebody swept the porch and washed the windows and obsessed over every repair. I wonder what they would think if they saw what their old pride and joy looks like now. I've been to a lot of messed up, run-down places with terrible poverty and the worst crime in the country. I'm rarely intimidated, but there was something about East Cleveland that didn't sit right. Maybe it was the reputation. It was certainly the way it looked. But there was a feeling, kind of an energy, on some of the back roads of East Cleveland that made me doubt my decision to get back in there. I went to East Cleveland in the summer of 2021. Most of the time I go to rundown cities in the winter when the skies are gray and the trees are bare. I think maybe all the vegetation made it all seem so much worse though. A lot of East Cleveland feels very sketch. It's definitely dangerous here. A lot of the main streets look like they peaked decades ago. But going back to the 1950s, things were jamming here. This was the most densely populated Cleveland suburb. A lot of people here made their living in coal steel and shipbuilding and railroads but then the demand for american-made manufacturing plummeted we know the story jobs went overseas and so people had to leave they needed work and then the ones who moved in were far less motivated there's less than a third of the population that's left in east cleveland today 40 percent of the homes are vacant and 40 percent of people here don't even have a car Households here make about 20K a year, and one in every 1,000 residents was murdered last year. What in the hell, people? There's nothing they can do, or want to do. With the price of lumber, it would cost more to board these buildings up than the buildings are worth. They're actually trying to demolish a lot of East Cleveland. Detroit had success turning back its old hoods to nature. This neighborhood probably won't even be here one day. So I'm glad I had a chance to see it. And this is all a mile or so from a really nice leafy suburb. Proves you don't have to go too far to find people who have it worse than you. Really makes you appreciate what you have. I feel bad for the children who grow up in a place like this. There's millions of people living in areas like this with no hope of getting out.
okay, so the places we've seen so far are dangerous, but I never really felt threatened in any of them. But the weekend I went to Oakland, man, oh man, I think Oakland might be the worst place I've been to. I'm not kidding. I was in San Francisco documenting the homeless problem in the fall of 2021. And I had heard there was a big homeless problem in Oakland too. So I crossed the bridge and spent a weekend in Oakland looking around. Some of the things I saw in Oakland are just mind blowing. Like there were all these Hoovervilles lining the streets on the edge of downtown. It all looked like something you'd see on TV, something in Haiti or East Asia. Entire blocks were made out of wood and tarps and whatever the homeless people could scrap together. And it did not look temporary. I saw entire camp zones filled with trash where hundreds of people were living hand to mouth in the dirt like they were war refugees. I saw blocks and blocks of vacant warehouse districts that looked like they had been bombed out. And then there's the neighborhoods. Now, usually I drive through bad areas in the morning before people get up. I drove through Oakland's in the late afternoon when they were up and very active. This is East Oakland, the part of town where the worst of the crime happens. Now it's not nearly as bad here as it was back in the 1990s when the Bloods and Crips were shooting the place up every night, but it's still really bad here. And the worst part is there's hardly any police presence here. Oakland is straight up lawless. People speed, steal, shoot, shoot up, whatever they want, and it goes pretty much overlooked. The cops are outnumbered. Jails are full. Only one in four crimes is solved here. And every year, one in 12 people is shot, robbed, assaulted, or murdered. I probably shouldn't have gone in there. Just about every house here has a gate and bars on the window. The whole region is one big maze of fences and walls. As I was driving around, I was like, where's the way to escape? Now we've seen a lot of places that might not have hope, but that's a decision they made. Anyone can choose hope and any of these people can get out of these places if they really want to. I should have stopped and talked to some of the people and asked them why they're still here. Maybe I should have gotten out of my car more. I looked online for professors who had studied urban decay and I found somebody who wrote a paper about urban decay and mentioned a bunch of the places I talked about in this video. So I figured I'd see if he talked to me and he did. Okay. Um, Mike, you're a professor of urban planning at UCLA and you've written about the decline of some of our biggest cities. Um, personally, how worried are you um, about the decline of parts of this, uh, of America? So, I guess I'm a little worried. I'm going to clarify something very quickly, though. Um, what I've written about, well, well, I've written about two different things. <laughs> One is uh, some cities that used to be very big that have declined for a long time, right? And that describes Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo. You know, Cleveland right now is uh, its population is probably a third of what it was in 1950. It used to be one of the biggest, richest cities in the country. It isn't today. So it's a relatively small city. Um, our biggest cities, you know, New York, Los Angeles, uh, the, the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, big in terms of population, big in terms of economy, um, are not declining. I, I've written about this. They have a lot of troubles, but their troubles actually stem from the fact that they're growing so fast, right? So there are two different things going on, and I worry about both of them. Right. I think anyone who studies cities worries about the fact that cities like Detroit, Milwaukee, uh, Cleveland have struggled now for decades and haven't quite been able to get back to where they once were. And also worry about places like Los Angeles, where I am now, uh, that despite 
on paper, you know, having a lot of economic growth, a lot of job growth, uh, a lot of things seem to be going wrong here. Right. We have a huge homeless population. People are upset by our transportation system, upset by our housing costs. So I'm worried about both, but they are two very different problems. Mm -hmm. Who do we blame for the decline in our in the cities that are that are going downhill? Who or what do we blame? Well, I'm not. <laughs> uh, blame is a is sort of a, a word I try to avoid. And I guess I'll, I'll ask again, like when you say going downhill, right? Um, are you talking about Detroit or are you talking about San Francisco? Because they are two um, two very different things. Yeah, the, the the cities that were once good that are now uh, abandoned, where people are leaving um, Buffalo, some towns in the Midwest, places yeah. like Memphis, places like East Cleveland, um, the I cities think, that were once good. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I just want to clarify because I, I used to live in upstate New York. They're still good. I mean, th these are places that a lot of people call home and they love them a lot, right? I don't want to just say they're bad places, right? I think that's a, a little bit insensitive, they, but they, they've run into trouble, right? Um, and I think the common denominator in a lot of these places is that uh, in some ways, at some point, the rug got pulled out from under them, by which I mean that the economic reason for their existence changed. And so if you look throughout the Rust Belt, um, what you often see is cities that were built along large either bodies of water or waterways because that gave them a big advantage in a manufacturing economy. Um, and two things happened, right? That manufacturing economy no longer was viable um, in the Midwestern states for a bunch of different reasons. But one of the biggest ones was just that you could get cheaper labor somewhere else. Um, and those waterways were no longer as important as they once were because we built highways and we got air travel and, and on and on and on. And so this this huge advantage they once had wasn't there anymore. And and what happened is, you know, I'm simplifying greatly for, for a handful of these places, um, they couldn't diversify their industrial base and start doing something else. And I don't. You know, maybe someone smarter than me knows who to blame for that, but but there's a fair amount of luck that's involved, right? So so to give you an example, uh, in 1980, Boston and Detroit were both in probably equally dire straits. Um, Boston's per capita income was probably just a little bit higher than Detroit's, but both of them had been losing a lot of population, lost a lot of industrial base. Um, there were cities that had been built along waterways to have a lot of manufacturing and it disappeared. And Boston turned itself around. Um, honestly, one of the reasons it turned itself around was just there's a ton of universities there. And so in an economy that was turning away from manufacturing and what we might call unskilled labor toward knowledge-based labor, it had a workforce just ready to go. And Detroit didn't. Um, Detroit, for a city of its size in, in 1960, 1970, 1980, um, really didn't have that many universities, right? It sort of it has Wayne State, University of Michigan is not far, whereas Boston is just like, you know, you walk down the street, you bump into a college, and that helped. Like, is that to Boston's credit? Not really. I mean, it was sort of an accident of history. And so um, now you can then say, I think, that uh, because of that, you know, people continued to leave Detroit. Um, people didn't move there as much. Uh, people who did move there were drawn less by job prospects and more by the fact that the housing was cheap, right? All these things sort of add up and compound each other. And so what happens is that once, you know, what, once decline starts, and I'm sort of talking about Detroit, but this could apply to Milwaukee or Cleveland. I don't mean to pick on Detroit. It's just sort of an archetype. Um, you, you end up in kind of a vicious cycle, right? Where uh, you don't have jobs, and so people leave, and your tax base shrinks. And then once your tax base shrinks, it's it's harder to do a good job governing the city, right? It's harder to deliver services. And one of the things about declining cities that makes this so vexing is that the people leave, but the land area doesn't change, right? Detroit is no smaller in land area than it was in 1950, but it's much, much smaller in terms of population, which means that this this lower base of people and a lower income base of people now has to provide services to the same amount of land, right? You still need to have fire trucks and police cars that can cover that whole area in a short amount of time. Uh, you need to be able to 
uh, maintain a huge infrastructure that stretches out the entire land area of the city on less money. And so what do you do, right? You're either going to not do it as well because you just can't raise enough money to do that, or uh, you're going to have to tax the people who are left at a higher rate to get the money. Guess what? Both of those things are going to encourage more people to leave, right? Lousy services or higher taxes. And so it's a, um, I, I think it's a, a little less accurate to think of this in terms of blame and more accurate to think in terms of without some external help, um, once a city enters into this process, it's just very hard to get back on track. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, some people will say um, it, socialism is the reason for a city's decline. Some will say it's unrestrained capitalism uh, or it, I guess you know, it's case by case. Yeah. But I mean, I think the problem with big, big sort of declarations like that is, is um, you can look at San Francisco, for instance, and some people will look at San Francisco and say, the problem here is capitalism. Like, look at all the tech. And some people will say, no, the problem is socialism. It's San Francisco for crying out loud. Look at all the, you know, all the subsidies and the leftist government and so forth. Uh, but, you know, if, if the problem's capitalism, then, you know, why is housing relatively inexpensive in Houston, which is, I'm sure, just as capitalist as San Francisco is? And if the problem's socialism, like, people seem to love Helsinki, right? Pretty socialist really well run, really well governed. Like, I, I think that it's not that useful to try and grab a big, vague ideological term and blame it for something specific happening to a particular city. Do people in cities make mistakes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you're, and the thing is, if your economy is on the edge, those mistakes can be quite costly, right? Boston has more of a cushion in many ways than Milwaukee or Cleveland does. They can fumble around a bit because People just want to be in Boston because of the jobs. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how helpful it is to just say like capitalism, socialism. I mean, I think it it's something people on Twitter do, but, you know, I don't think it really sheds too much light on things. Yeah, that, that's what the YouTube commenters usually say over and over <laughs> whenever I talk about this stuff. Everybody wants to blame uh, socialism and capitalism. And it, it's, it's a big blame game that they like to go back and forth with. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, one, one I think, common problem, and, and so this, I don't want to, again, get into blame, but it, it's a recurrent mistake that's happened throughout the latter part of the 20th century and probably into the 21st, dealing with these cities that have lost a lot of population, has been a desire on the part of policymakers, which is somewhat understandable, to try and get them back to, like, what they once were. Right. To, and this is, again, I think, understandable, especially for people who live there and remember it. Right. I mean, people are very fond of the places they live. Like, I'm sure you are. I am. I mean, and so we don't always think totally rationally about them. And so sometimes the economic development assistance that a place like a Detroit or a Cleveland will get is sort of like, well, if we build you know, this convention center or this sports stadium or this, you know, if we spend a lot of tax dollars to lure this company there, uh, the comeback begins and we're going to be the Detroit or Cleveland or Milwaukee of your, you know, a, a global center of power and so forth. That almost never works. Right. And, and I think it often ends up just being money thrown at, uh, you know, money, for lack of a better term, money kind of thrown down the drain, right? You know, dumping huge amounts of money into a football stadium or a big convention center or or even just to try and get some company to put its headquarters in the downtown. Um, what's much more realistic is is also a little less sexy, right? Which is like, we should give assistance to these cities to help their school districts, Um help make them safer, help make their services more reliable. Because at the end of the day, if you want people and firms to move to a city, you know, you, you can never fully control that, right? But, but the reliable thing is not like, hey, we have an NFL stadium. It's, this is the kind of place you and your employees would actually like to live, right? That, that you've got 
good roads and good transit and and schools where your kids, you know, you'd be happy to have your kids go there and so forth. And so I think there's been a little less, a lot of urban policy in the United States has what we call a capital bias, right? We want to spend money on big structures and things that we can cut ribbons in front of and be like, yay. Um, and, and a little bit less, uh, we, we spend less than we should on the types of services that actually are harder to see, but they do pay off a lot better which is like good investments in schools, just routine maintenance of, of our sewer lines and electric grids and stuff, the things that make day-to-day -day life sort of good. Um, and so I do think, you know, uh, if you were to, to sort of want to sort of have a, a blame, I guess, there, there has been a little too much focus in just the sort of economic development world over time. And it is getting a little bit better on, you know, we want to just bring it back to the glory days rather than like, let's just get this to a place where, um, for a lot of people, the quality of life is just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in your paper, you discussed um, not only giving cities money for some of that stuff, but there was also a theory that you give people money so they can leave the, the place and that will help too. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, this is a, a longstanding debate sort of related to what I just mentioned in economics and urban policy, which is that when a city does decline, um, are we responsible, the, the broader we, let's say like the U.S., for instance, are we responsible to that city as an entity or responsible to the people who live there, first and foremost, right? And there's a there's a, a strong case, and I think you can, you can there's a counter case too, but there's a strong case that says, look, if, if we're looking at Detroit or Cleveland and we say we're worried about these places, oftentimes what we mean is that we're worried about there are people in them, they don't have a lot of good options, um, because they don't have a lot of good options, they're, they're constrained in what they could do, uh, is, is the right thing to do to step in and say, hey, we're going to try and rebuild this city around you so that it gives you more options? Or is it to say, look, you know, here's X amount of dollars. Um, if you want to stay where you are, by all means, do it. But if you really feel like you do better in Houston or Phoenix or wherever, Use that money and, and go strike out on a fresh start. Uh, and I think that if there's a case for that sort of what we call person-based assistance, it really is based on this idea that like our ability from a like to 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 affirmatively use policy to bring back a city is really limited. Like we've tried for a long time to sort of reignite growth in Rust Belt cities, and it just hasn't worked. So that's not to say no Rust Belt cities have come back. Right. But often when they've come back, it hasn't really been because of, you know, the government sort of saying it will it will it will make that happen. Um, but we do know that if you we do know that people are leaving these places anyways. Right. That that like this is the story of your buffaloes in Detroit. It's like people leave and, and people also when they don't move there. And so if you want to give some people money, they probably will go to places where there are more jobs and so forth and make a better life for themselves. Um, the, the one thing I'd add to that is just that if you do that, right, if you were to give, cut everybody in Detroit a check and a bunch of them left, you're not absolved of the responsibility of what happens to, to the folks who stay, right? Which is to say that if what you've done is just encourage even more out migration, then the same problem exists for the people in Detroit who are left behind, which is now they have even fewer resources. Um, and so one thing that, that my co-author and I in that paper you wrote suggested was, you know, people are going to leave. History shows people are going to leave these places anyways. Um, and if the government was to say, okay, we want to help with that migration, that's fine. But there still needs to be some assurance that if you stay in one of these shrinking cities, uh, the, that the basic services are, are on point. Right, that they're safe, that the fire department and the ambulance will get to the house, that the houses aren't falling apart. Um, and so, again, that sort of suggests that there, there would be some place based aid just based on like these places do have to be livable. Mm hmm. So all biases aside and and leaving out, you know, what you actually would want to see. How, do you feel that some of our bigger cities that are in a free fall can actually stabilize and turn themselves around one day or are they beyond help? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I, and, and it's sort of because it's for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, 
it's very hard for us to know where the next shot of growth is going to come, right? Like in, again, in 1980, people thought Boston was doomed. People thought New York was doomed, right? Like go watch Serpico. It's just like this, you know, the popular version of Des Moines is like, it was doomed. Uh, there was a sign outside the airport in Seattle that said, well, the last person leaving, please turn out the lights. And then what happened? Uh, eight years after that, uh, Bill Gates got homesick. He had started Microsoft in New Mexico, got homesick. They went home, him and Paul Allen, to Seattle. And now Seattle's a, a tech. You know, it has too much prosperity is what most people there would tell you. It's a weird thing to say, but that's what they would tell you. And And so these are sort of strokes of fortune that can be very consequential. And it would be wrong to just look at um, uh, any given city in the U.S. and say, well, you, you never recover it. Um, at the same time, like, it's hard to predict that or count on it, right? And so I do think there are, and, and there's lots of people besides me who do a lot more work on this kind of issue than I do, um, and, and they'd have better, more specific policy ideas. But I think that uh, it, it, while it is true that sort of growth predicts growth and decline predicts decline, um, there's no reason at all why we have to say that these cities just have to continue to spiral. You know, I, I do think there are things that can be done. And again, it's you step in not to sort of make them start growing like gangbusters. That's just not something the government's very good at. But to, yeah, stabilize them, um, make them so that they are you know, they're, they're right now, these are still places that lots of people live in and love and couldn't imagine living anywhere else, but they could use some help to just kind of make their services better. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that can very much be done. Yeah. And you hear over and over, I do personally, we give all this money to Ukraine, $100 billion, we give all this money overseas when our own cities are crumbling and we've got depression and economic instability. And it, do you agree with that or do you, do you have an opinion on that? No, I mean, I think, you know, we we do spend a lot of money on our own cities um, and it's just it doesn't end up getting publicized a lot because, you know, it's it's nowhere nowhere near as uh, sort of exciting or newsworthy or what have you as a war in Ukraine, which sort of came out of nowhere and, and now and occupied the world's attention. Um, the and, and, you know, the federal budget is is awfully big. Um, it, so it's, it's, there is room for us to, uh, to spend in our own cities and help out other countries. I think the, I, I think, well, there's, but I think there, there's two points that could be raised for that. One is that again, um, we could just, and I, I know very little about foreign aid to the Ukraine's military, so I'm not even going to try and talk about the merits or demerits of that. I, I think I'm generally in favor of it, but, um, one is that the money we spend on our own cities, as I mentioned already, we don't even necessarily have to spend more. We could just spend it a little bit more wisely, right? Tax breaks for big firms to locate places, tax breaks for sports stadiums. If, if more of these just became sort of investment in basic services, that would go a long way. And you wouldn't actually even see the total dollar amount being spent change very much. Um, the second thing, though, just related to... Uh, to, to sort of foreign countries is that if you wanted to give a lot of uh, our struggling cities a shot in the arm, you could let in more immigrants, right? I mean, there's just people all over the world who would love to live in the United States. And this is not the way our immigration system works right now. Um, and there's pluses and minuses to changing it to this. But if you said to people like, yeah, you can come, but like for the first five years or something, you gotta live in Detroit. I mean, Detroit's population would go way up and, it, it, there's a lot of evidence out there that's pretty persuasive that if you want to inject some vitality into an urban area, a bunch of immigrants will do it. Like they show up, they're entrepreneurs, they're hard workers, you know, that this is a lot of this is a pro pro product of selection bias, which is like what kind of person actually picks up and moves across the world is a very ambitious person. Um, and so, you know, uh, that is a, that's one way you could help foreign people in foreign countries and help our own cities is just let more people into the United States. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, doctors, nurses, teachers, we need all Everybody. police officers. Yeah, like some of the core industries and, and um, job, the, the stuff that's important. It's hard to get people to do these things. You can, they can't even get people to, the, they don't want to plumb. They don't want to be electricians anymore. They don't want to do lumber. They don't want to drive trains. 
Um, I, I personally think that's because college was told you got to go to college, the trades. No, you don't do that anymore. You got to be smart and go to college and, you know, and, and that has fallen out of favor. And so kids these days that want nothing to do with the, the respectful trades that, that in the fifties through eighties were like a, a backbone for a lot of families. That's how they made their money. That's right. And, and I think so, uh, you know, um, and, and wages in some of those fields, not all, but some of those fields have, have contracted a bit too, which makes them less attractive. But um, yeah, it would, uh, it, it's, I think there are, there, there's jobs that a lot of native born Americans don't want to do for a variety of reasons. I think the, the sort of cult of college that you, that you mentioned is a part of it for sure. Um, other reasons as well, but that a lot of people around the world would just love to do them in the United States. And it would be, uh, in many respects, a win-win, right? So that's one thing worth considering. Mm -hmm. One more question. Why, yeah. why are people, so whenever I publish a video that's about, you know, ghetto and like dangerous and bad and declining, those videos get 10 times as many clicks as when I'm like, here's a really pretty little town in the Midwest. Like, why are people so fascinated by, by ghettos and urban blight and decline? Uh, that that might actually be a better question for a, you know, a psychologist or a, a, a something like that. Um, you know, I, I think you see the same thing just in popular culture and movies, though, right? Which is that we're we're drawn in, in not in our personal lives, right? I mean, but we're drawn by the idea of danger and dysfunction and pathology and so forth. Um, and and you know, in, in many ways, it is. Uh, you know, in some ways it's harmless. Like I'm a pretty pacifistic guy, but I like watching movies where people shoot at each other because I know it's fake. Um, but in some ways it is, there's been a lot of work done by sociologists, I think about uh, the, the extent to which people's appeal for that and then the market sort of supplying it because there is a demand for it does create in some respects sort of a unrealistic and, and sort of negative ideas of what it's like to live in some of these places, right? Which is to say that like there are places in the country that absolutely have a lot of problems, but again, you know, you can go to uh, a public housing project or a low income neighborhood in, in Los Angeles and, and, you know, understand that a lot of people there are, are having a tough time and you might personally not want to live there, but it doesn't come close remotely to sort of like, what you might expect from a stereotype, you know, bullets flying and, you know, just, so it's, a, um, I think it is a, it's, it's like a feedback loop where for whatever reason, and I don't pretend to understand it, uh, the typical person is drawn more to stories like that than to upbeat stories. And then, so we supply them and then on it goes. Yeah. I think people just, part of it is they like to see, feel better about themselves and, and watch like, Oh my God, these people are suffering. God, at least I'm not suffering like that. Like, I mean, it could be, it's uh, although <laughs> I wish it, if that uh, there, there could be something to that. I wish that they, whoever was acting motivated on that impulse would take the next step and just have a little more just sort of general gratitude, right. Rather than just clicking onto the next video. Um, because those of us who, who, who do live in, um, in kind of healthy places uh, and 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 stable communities and so forth, uh, you know, I think we 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 should we do take it for granted a little bit, and we should be quite grateful for it, and we should think more about what we can do to to make sure everybody has that that option. Yeah, I agree. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you on not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. I know awesome, reliable agents all over the country, and I'd love to connect you to somebody who can help you search for that perfect home. Hey guys, if you learned something new about America or what it's like to live in America, great you should think about subscribing and turning on your notifications. You can also click one of these videos or playlists for more. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production.